welcome in uh, to another episode. And we've got uh, Mega Verma uh, with us again today. She has been trumped from Twitter, so she has been uh, sent over to the Instagram world where you can find her, um, Mega Verma underscore art. And she's going to be spending um, some time with us today talking about the relationship between art and culture and politics. And she's got a lot of great uh, information and things to share with us. And we look forward to a really good conversation with her. So, uh, Mega, first of all, congratulations on your move and uh, welcome on today. Thank you. Yeah, I, j I recently moved to the UK because I got married. So, Congre yeah, congratulations. Yeah, congratulations. Um, so, Mega, what do you have for us in terms of, I know you spent a lot of time studying art, you, you, you run art courses, you, um, you know, put out a lot of material about actually studying art. Right. You know, people, they don't examine art the way I think art is meant to be examined. There's a lot, often a lot of, you know, hidden messages in, in, in color and skin tone and, 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 you know, to the finest detail. So what can you teach us today? What can you offer us um, about uh, your, your expertise and all this? And, and what do you have to share? Well, first of all, I would like to talk about why it's important to study the arts in the first place, because. I come from a science and technology background. I did my master's in neuroscience. So, you know, I spent eight long years in STEM and I was, you know, I was doing a PhD when I left. Um, and I realized when I was there that scientists are very good at collecting data, but data is not the same thing as information because information is how we package data in, in a certain pattern and put it in a hierarchy to answer a question. So you can't actually have information from data unless you have a question or a goal that you're trying to uh, accomplish. So for example, if you have, you know, um, all the prices of food in a grocery store, it doesn't matter. Like all those numbers are meaningless unless you're asking a question at the end of it. So what is the average price of meat, you know? So then you have, then you can actually get information. So what I found in the sciences is that people were very, very good at collecting data, but very bad at collecting information. And specifically, um, I think this is a, like, you know, on a larger scale, this is due to a problem with in, in society of uh, utilitarianism without an end. So imagine that, um, you know, utilitarianism is a word that most people will be familiar with. It's um, a worldview in which everything has value insofar it, as it has utility. But this worldview is incomplete because it doesn't consider utility for what, you know? And most of the time, this, this question is unconsciously answered for us, utility for making money. So when we have this, um, you uh, you, when we have this like unconscious framework in everybody's mind for everything that they do, then what happens is that you don't actually get a richer society, which you would expect, you know, if everyone's main goal is to make money, you get a richer society. What they get instead is a society that's constantly running on a treadmill for money, but never actually becomes wealthy. Whereas when you had societies like in, like I always loved, I love studying the Renaissance because it's so at odds, like on a spiritual level from modern Western society. The Renaissance was the opposite of a utilitarian society because the main goal for them was to glorify, like, you know, especially the Italian Renaissance, like I'll be specific for mm -hmm. the academics who might be listening, but their primary <clears throat> goals were to glorify themselves for for all eternity and to glorify God and also to remind people of their religious ideals at all times. You would think that that kind of society might be very poor because it's not focused on making money. And yet they were extremely wealthy and they built some of the most beautiful cities that people still make pilgrimages to go see. So it's a very interesting question that sometimes when you and run towards something directly, you don't get that thing. And I think it's because utilitarianism is all arrows. It's like a means to an end, but it doesn't have any end. Like money could be one end, but people aren't really clear about that because when they make money, then they want other things with that money. Money itself is an arrow. It can never be an end. That's why utilitarianism, modern utilitarianism fails because money itself is not an end. 
it's a means to an end for something like what do you use that money for um do you use it for entertainment do you use it for freedom do you use it for comfort mm. shelter etc after your basic necessities you have to think on a grander scale what are people using their money for money is kind of like a proxy for power so if you have if you're just constantly focused on building power but you don't have an end for that then you are actually less motivated and less focused on how to build that power because you might be sacrificing those things that you built that power for and the perfect example for this is um a surgeon who became the surgeon because they wanted to um have more power in life they wanted more prestige they wanted more money they wanted security and then uh and, and freedom to move wherever they wanted because poverty by its very definition is, is a type of limitation on your life but um the surgeon if he spends 16 hours a day or like 100 plus hours a week working even if he's making that money that would buy him freedom and prestige he can never actually enjoy that freedom because he gives it up in the process do you see what i mean so i think yeah, like, to, you know, it's like a lot of rambling thoughts, but the arts offer people like a recalibration at the end of the day to understand why they're doing everything. What is the point? Yeah, Megan, I was actually going to jump in and, and, and you hit on something that really stuck out to me um, when you brought up cities and how cities used to look. Right. And, you know, I, I've seen pictures um, even recently as to it was almost like a, a a camera viewing a single part of the street from say today and then the same spot maybe a hundred years ago or what have you and i know you being in england i think you made something i don't know if it was a tweet or an instagram post but how neat it is to see to be in a place or to see a place where somebody's like hey you know this place is 800 years old yeah. right and you know and, and and you see that and i think you know art is expressed in the way we design our cities the, it's expressed in the way that we design our culture and like you said it has an end to it right and so what do you think um because you kind of touched on how people are you know they're working to build up all of these things like you know they're they're, they're they've got a job like a surgeon where they're, they're they're making a lot of money but they can't use it for freedom or, or for you know a nice whatever they might be doing because their, their time is so engrossed in their work um maybe can you explain a little bit or, or talk a little bit about how you know the purpose of art maybe back then, because I, I believe that, you know, sculptors, they didn't put their names on their thing, was to glorify God, as you said before, you know, like they didn't even take credit for a lot of their work. Do you have any thoughts on how, you know, maybe um, an author's, or not an author, but an artist's purpose has kind of maybe shifted or changed over the centuries? So I have, I've actually written in depth about this on my Substack. stack. Um, it's an article that I wrote called What Killed the Arts? Um, and I explained in depth the, uh, like how that shift occurred specifically during the Reformation in the 16th century, um, where the artist had to dramatically shift his business plan and his business model in order to make a decent living from the arts. And that actually, that shift in his business model for making money is what caused the arts to shift from being the arts to being entertainment, the entertainment industry. Um, because my hypothesis is that when we expose the arts and judgment of the arts to the free market to decide, then what happens is it becomes entertainment instead. So we call um, what would be the arts in our society is actually the entertainment industry. So our Netflix movies uh, and TV shows um, are top billboard artists making songs, um, playing music. So all of these things, concerts, they're all classified under entertainment and not art, which is a very important distinction because entertainment is something that appeals to our most um, easily accessible hedonistic senses. Whereas the art is something that um, calls, calls you to be a nobler version of yourself to contemplate it. So for example, reading um, reading classic literature or appreciating um, a very beautiful piece of classical music, it's 
like it's not easily accessible it takes an attention span and some kind of like study some kind of um patience in order to appreciate it but you'll notice if you ever are curious whether something is art or whether something is entertainment there's a very easy test you can do um just after you've finished with that thing whether it's entertainment or art think about how you feel afterwards do you feel um exalted are you like looking at things in your ordinary life in a different way or do you feel depleted and you've forgotten what you saw so for example um i got tiktok when it first came out and like i noticed that after like an hour on tiktok i didn't remember anything that i saw it was so mysterious or like you know if you ask me to sing any pop song that i've heard in the last five years like I don't actually remember the lyrics, but if if you ask me to sing the lyrics of like a song that really deeply touched me, then I can remember them. Um, or like, you know, a t- Netflix TV show that you binged, like you'll notice that there's some, some shows that actually make you see the world differently afterwards, make you judge people differently or situations and some that just are forgettable and you just, watch them in the moment and were entertained um where was i going with this you asked how the arts changed yes and so the artist during the renaissance was making money from patronage so um the church was the number one patron but also as wealthy families um titian is a great example of someone who didn't really make money from the church he was a portrait painter and he got paid by uh, wealthy families all over italy to who, who commissioned him and he became kind of a celebrity because he had a journalist friend who would write about his work. And so the artist in this time period though, by and large, did not make a bunch of paintings and then hope to sell them. He got his patrons first and then made only what was commissioned. And the way that he got patrons is because he was part of a guild. So the guild would give him, um, give him some kind of credibility so that anyone who wanted to commission an artist would simply go to the guild and say, okay, who's the best artist to do this kind of painting? And then they would recommend them. So it was like a a system was in place. And then if you wanted to be part of a guild, like at 10 years old, you'd become an apprentice. And then after being an apprentice for many years where you learn the basics, then maybe you get to paint a little bit on different paintings. Um, And then you, and then you get, like, you know, your training is complete and then you are a full artist and you become a member of a guild and you can open your own workshop. Um, So that's how artists made money and the church would pay big money for commissions. So for example, Bernini made an amazing living as an artist. He was, uh, he was, he's the sculptor responsible for a lot of the structures in the Vatican. Um, He's responsible for Apollo and Daphne, a very famous sculpture. Um, And he is like, he's considered to be one of the best sculptors who like, you know, was the rightful uh, heir of like Michelangelo. Like that's how good he was. Whereas artists post-Reformation were kind of, they're really changed. They would make a bunch of artwork and then go out to the marketplace and hope to sell it. So they started catering their work Mm -hmm. to what sells instead of what is like what they want to make. So um, when the church commissioned something, they said, okay, make something to glorify St. Teresa. The artist has a lot of um, freedom to make what he thinks is an interesting and incredible piece. He gets to actually be an artist. Whereas when an artist is just focusing on what sells for the masses, he's going to lower his quality um, and make something as easily accessible as possible. Yeah, let me let me ask you a question on that, because I remember um, watching a talk from a few years ago, and it was a debate actually on the biblical event of the Annunciation, where the angel Gabriel appears to the Blessed Virgin Mary and tells her that she would become the mother of Christ. And there's a famous painting of this event, and I don't know, I can't think off the top of my head who might have painted it, but... um, there was a debate around accuracy, right? And it was like, um, 
in this moment, would the Blessed Virgin Mary have genuflected before the angel, which she have knelt before the angel, or would the angel have knelt before her? And there was this interpretation of, you know, kind of blending art and kind of blending accurate, say, theology. So maybe if you can, if you have any thoughts on, do you think that when looking at art of a particular event, so this event took place, say, 2,000 years ago, but people are creating it in art today, do you think they should be free to kind of put their own interpretation on how it might have looked? Or do you think they should strive for a, a historical accuracy in the sense that, you know what, I have to draw the Blessed Virgin Mary standing in my work or paint or whatever, because she never would have knelt before an angel or genuflected before an angel. So how do you, how do you think, um, what do you think, you know, in terms of that debate of accuracy with historic events and, and actual art today? So uh, if we look at the history of, of this type of religious art, there's many artists who have already gotten in trouble for this. Um, so for example, Veronese, um, Mategna, they would um, paint biblical events of uh, biblical characters wearing clothes that people wore in contemporary Venice, you know, of mm -hmm. their time period. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they got in trouble for that because it was not you know, historically accurate clothing. Like why would these biblical characters be wearing a dress that someone wears in 15th century Italy? Mm. So mm. Um, it, it's already happened. And I think rather than focusing on the material reality of the historical event, it's, it's actually good that artists, I think it's good that artists take their artistic liberty to describe an event in a story because um, they're capturing the spirit of what happened rather than the physicality of it. And I think it's something like, you know, did Gabriel kneel or not? I think uh, there's there's a very famous um, altarpiece by Giotto where the angel is kneeling for the Annunciation and Mary is sitting on, on a throne. Um, so it's like, because it's up to, because it's up for debate anyway, and there's no, you know, set, rules about it it's i think it's okay that they paint it like that uh because they're capturing the spirit of the story in the way that they understand it um and there's you know different people show different events in different ways um caravaggio is famous for depicting biblical events with a lot of gore and a lot of um mm. you know like he shows kind of the hideousness of these gory events and reminds us that they're not it's not all flowers and rainbows. Um, so it's, it's because of the type of person Caravaggio was that he could see the world in that way and see the stories in that way. So I think there is, uh, I think limiting artists' ability to interpret stories and represent them how they want would leave us with Egyptian hieroglyphics because Egyptian hieroglyphics, uh, oh, and uh, I suppose, um, Orthodox iconography is also very similar yes. to this, where they have yes, yes, yes. very, very strict rules about how they can depict things because their artwork is not really merely art. It's like a way of communication uh, with the divine. So for both Egyptian hieroglyphics and iconography, I could be wrong about the iconography. There's a lot more about it that I don't know. Um, but, you know, with Egyptians, they, you know, people think it's so funny how they make these hieroglyphs of people and they think, oh, it's because the Egyptians couldn't draw. But actually they could draw. It's just that they had very strict rules because the hieroglyph was a form of communication. So if you wanted to communicate a foot, you would always draw the foot in profile because that's where the foot, that's the angle at which a foot looks most like a foot. Um, same for, but the eye would look most like the eye looking head on so you'd have a face in profile because that's hmm. the most characteristic way of showing a face but then you'd have the eye in pro eye looking straight ahead same for like the legs and the hips and then you just get that traditional like that quintessential hieroglyphic look um or they'd show like a pond from above but then show the fish sideways in the pond and that's obviously wrong and then the trees would would not be looking at trees like aerially from above. The trees would be like flat out on all sides. Hmm. And that's because they said, well, if we draw the trees from an aerial perspective over this pond, 
then someone looking above wouldn't know if they're trees or their bushes, right? Mm, true. So that's how they that's how their mind wow. works with this. So they said, okay, we have to we know that trees look kind of like bushes when you look from above, but we have to make sure that the message is crystal clear. So we have to draw the trees laying flat, even though it's me... not, you know, correct perspective. Yeah, it makes me think of how you've probably seen those drawings, the street art right where like it's painted on a road but if you're standing at a certain angle it looks like there's a giant hole or in the road or a cliff that you're falling off where it's just perspective it's just art and they you know you have to be able to look at it at the right angle to get the actual effect um not to be redundant with this but what do you think about um like you know if we take historical events again i'll go back to christianity here like we take christ right he was one man who you know had a certain skin tone had a certain eye color what do you think about interpretations of, of, you know, somebody like that? Like, do you, cause I have seen some beautiful paintings of the Blessed Virgin Mary in Japanese culture, in, you know, I, even like Coptic, you know, culture, um, American culture where they, they change her skin tone, they change her lips, they change her eyes, they change her hair. Obviously she was only one person who had only one sort of skin tone and whatnot. So um, do you support you know, different interpretations of maybe a historical figure? Or do you think that we should try to be, you know, accurate in our depiction of them? Or, or do you see both sides to that? How would you, what do you have to say about that? I think I see both sides. And I think the side that wants to um, keep the character consistent with historical accuracy, I think that side is not looking at art <laughs> as an artwork, it's looking at it as more of a historical account um, you know, like a, like an artifact or like a, mm. a science diagram, like this is how a hot air balloon works. Like that would be, a, you have to make it as accurate as possible. Whereas an artwork is not really about the material reality of things. It's about the idea that that artwork has, um, conveys through its formation. So I, I don't think that historical accuracy is necessary to have a good work of art. So for example, if someone made a fantastic painting about uh, Mary and, or, or like, you know, from the Bible and unfortunately, but like the characters, you know, were all black mm -hmm. and that wouldn't be accurate because, you know, the characters in the Bible are Middle Eastern, like would that artwork be discredited as a bad work of art simply because their skin color is wrong? I don't think that's true because that artwork could be very fantastic in its own right and tell the story in a magnificent way um, that causes people to internalize certain ideas that they didn't think about before. Um, and so by its own right, it would still be an amazing work of art. Um, I think historical accuracy is for historical documents, not for mm. works of art. Yeah, I, I can see that. And it, it kind of draws me, I have like two questions that I kind of want to bridge into, but I'll, I'll go to this one first. Um, Norman Rockwell, uh, I went to his museum in Massachusetts a few years back now, and, um, I loved his work and it made me think of what you, how you kind of just said, is it entertainment or is it art? And, um, so, you know, there's galleries and you walk through and there's descriptions of each painting and, and how, you know, the idea behind it and what it kind of represents. But then I can't think of his name, but his son had an exhibit as well. Norman Rockwell's son had a, his own little room. And the art, if you can call it that in my opinion, was completely inversed from his father. It was almost as if, um, do you remember that meme? It was like a banana taped to the wall. And they're like, this is modern yeah. art today. It was, it was very similar to that where you went from these beautiful, like early 1900s paintings of real life diners or whatever, to like this very strange abstract sort of like, you know, here's a twisted piece of metal, you know, let's put it behind glass to protect it so nobody touches it. Um, do you think art like that can be beautiful or is it objectively like, wow, what happened here? I don't think that's real art. I think that's trolling. That's just like I attention guess. seeking. That's not art but, at all. So it why, let me just jump in because that, ex yes. I looked at this, I'm like, who takes this seriously? But there were people who were very much like, wow, let's look at this. You know, like they, they took it kind of seriously. What do you think they're looking for? What are they trying to, to, to find? I think they're trying to be intellectuals. 
and uh, they're like completely out of touch with their senses. Like they're trying to show people how sophisticated they are by, by looking at that work. And, and, <laughs> mm. and really like the people who love that kind of work the most are art critics because, you know, if you have, if you see like a bunch of scribbles on a, on a canvas, or, yes, like, a yes, yes, exactly. Wall, yeah. It's, it's impossible to tell what that's about because it's actually about nothing. And so the art critic can then project their entire personal philosophies onto that work of art because it's not resist onto that work. I wouldn't even call it a work of art because it's not going to resist <clears> anything <throat> back because it's nothing. It's just a banana, you know? Mm. And so they can write essays and essays. Whereas when you look at a Norman Rockwell painting of the, the young teenage couple on a date yes. drinking mm -hmm. a milkshake, mm -hmm. what can you really write about that? You don't really need to say anything. The artwork speaks so profoundly for itself. It's just a piece about innocence, innocent love. It's cute. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's making people nostalgic for a certain time in their lives. Or maybe if they have kids, they're thinking about that. It's just mm. capturing a moment that is both ordinary and extraordinary. And it's archetypal, you know, the, the puppy love stage of, use when you're finally figuring you're first figuring out that you can have crushes on people so these kind of artworks <laughs> you can't write a lot about them because they're so good and mm. I realized this firsthand when I was teaching my art club and I had a lesson on Ivan Shishkin and for most of the uh, Ivan Shishkin is like an amazing landscape artist from Russia in the 19th century and um, okay. he was part of this group <clears throat> called the wandering artists the wanderers um, and his landscapes were, you know, boring to write about or talk about because you couldn't say anything about them, but they were magnificent. They were beautiful. Mm. And you actually did want to mm. look at them for a long time because there was a lot to take in and look at. Like he captured the essence and feeling of being in a rainy, muddy day without you ever having been there. Um, he captured the spirit of the landscape mm. and and that had never been done before. So I can see why art critics would prefer the crappy art because then they can write more about it and they can get citations and then they can get tenured positions. Um, but art that is actually good speaks for itself. Yeah, I was just pulling up a picture here because um, I wanted to refresh my memory. So <laughs> like you said, I, I, I'm remembering the people walking through the Norman Rockwell part. Right. And you are 100 percent right. It's it's almost like you describe my experience. People are looking at these pictures of, again, the couple sharing the milkshake or whatever. And there's nostalgia like, wow, it looks comfortable. It looks warm. You know, um, it's I, you can almost feel like a good feeling from it. But OK, the kind of I guess you could say just the conversation stops there. But I pulled up some images. His name is Peter Rockwell, um, the son. And there's a blob of clay with two feet on the bottom of it. And I remember people, like I said, looking at this, like, wow, you know, almost like they're trying to interpret, like, what is actually going on here? And I think that might kind of point something out here is the pictures that Norman Rockwell painted, what's there to interpret, right? There's two yeah. people sitting here. But what is this mess? What is this blob of clay or, you know, wire sticking it's, out? Yeah. I, I was just gonna ask you, do you think that so is the artist in this instance, Peter Rockwell, is he intentionally trolling? Or yeah, do you think they're, they're yeah, intentionally it's trolling? It's it, it, they're not, they may not be consciously aware of it, but they are. It's like, you know, when you start to, um, when you're a little kid and everyone's listening to your story for the first time, like in, in a big group, and mm. then you unintentionally start lying and exaggerating to make your story more exciting so that people will listen to you longer. Mm. It's that feeling, you know? <laughs> yeah. And, and all kids have experienced <clears throat> True. It. And then you feel yourself. And then afterwards, you ask yourself, why did I lie? You know, mm. why, why did I make up all this stuff? You had to but engage. It, <laughs> yeah. And it's yeah. like when you're aware of these behaviors, you can understand them better. Um, and you have to realize that the art museum and the art critic and the academy and the salon, these are all very new things. Art in the Renaissance, there was no salon, there was no academy, there was an there was a guild to train people how to create the work, but that guild's responsibility was not like you know reviewing artists or reviewing art or getting citations or tenure positions. 
And the people buying the artwork were not trying to do that either. They were not critics. They were not make, getting these commissioned paintings to put them in a museum. They were getting them to put them in their house or in a church or in a public square. So these artworks were literally made for people to enjoy, not for stuffy, onanistic, you know, navel-gazing academics to talk about. So when Bernini made the Four, the, the Four Rivers Fountain in um, Piazza Navona in Rome, mm. that is like one of the most <clears throat> magnificent fountains I've ever seen in my life. Like, I, I remember when I walked in and saw it for the first time, like, my sister and I were just like our jaws were on the floor at how mm. incredible it was. And it's like it engulfed you because it was so large and it forced you to walk around because it was so big. You couldn't really make sense of the whole picture. Mm. And sure. you were just in awe. And it was really made for people. It was not made for academics to interpret. Of course, you can interpret it because, you know, you'll have put symbols in there or um, to represent, you know, the different rivers or like historical mythical um references that he's making in the fountain and even those symbols were made for people because the average person couldn't read was not always educated and and able to read so but symbols were things that everyone could recognize so that's the the creation of the art museum ironically is probably what contributed most to killing the arts because it mm. created this academic class of interpreters. So let me ask you this then. Um, let me just take Da Vinci, for example. You know, his work is in, you know, you know, museums around the world that are, again, very, you know, protected with security. They're behind glass. You can't access it. You can't touch it. Um, my first question would be, was somebody like Da Vinci famous in his time where like, you know, did people recognize him to be or anybody else? I'm just using it as an example, but um, do you think these artists are recognized while they're alive or is it a, you know, centuries have gone by. So we see them in a different light. And do you think that um, was their work again with Da Vinci? Was he somebody who, do you think he did private things for people? Like, is there hidden work that we might not, we'll never see that maybe he painted for a friend or for, you know, a, a guy who said, Hey, can you, you know, work on this for me. Do you think their their art is both public and private, or do you think they were painting or, or working or sculpting or what have you for for extreme situations like the church or for anything in Rome or France or what have you? So I think you asked a couple of questions there. Um, so yeah. like contra the like modern Western people have this idea of artists as always being the underdog and always mm -hmm. being starving, not making money in their time. Yes, only yes, yes. Posthumously. Yeah. That's completely wrong. The most, <clears throat> like the best artists in the world always made tons of money while they were alive. Like it's only the shitty artists that kind of, like, you know, for the most part, there are some exceptions, but it's only like, you know, the mediocre artists that were remembered way after. Um, but I think the most of the artists that I've studied in their time period, they were immensely wealthy and recognized. So Bernini was mm. really famous. Da Vinci was really famous. Um, Titian, people were lining up to get portraits painted by him. Uh, mm -hmm. Lawrence Alma Tadema was fabulously wealthy. Edmund Leighton made tons of money and was the president of the, the Royal Academy of Art. Um, Bouguereau, the Academy didn't like him because his paintings were too, too boring because they couldn't talk about them. But his paintings were beautiful to people who wanted to buy them. And he was, as a result, very wealthy. So like for most, I think some exceptions are there. Like for example, Vermeer in Amsterdam, he never really sold any of his paintings and died in a lot of debt. Um, but I think there's multiple reasons for that. One is that Amsterdam in that time period was like very, it, it was it was like post-Reformation Amsterdam. So they didn't really appreciate, uh, it wasn't the artists who made the, the best art that was successful. It was the artist that could sell the most pieces to the buying public. And so it's like, you know, an amazing singer today who's singing like soulful music, having to compete with Cardi B and Cardi B is making more money, you yeah. know? Right. It's not because Cardi B is a better cases. singer. Hmm. So I think in, um, it depends on, on the type of society. So, but there are many, many artists throughout history who have made lots of money from their artwork while they're alive and gotten recognition for it. Um, with 
regard to um, whether or not there's any hidden work. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious. I think um, that's a very interesting question. And I think that there are a lot of, um, you know, art historians who are devoted to, you know, work at like Christie's or things like that, mm. who are trained at recognizing uh, an artist's hand in different works. And so sometimes pieces turn up that, you know, somebody inherited or somebody found and um, they bring it to a specialist and that person can recognize if it's done by this artist or if it's, you know, just a nobody who made it. Um, and they, you know, they do x-rays to see like if, what was the underpainting, what was the sketching like, uh, what type of paint did they use, um, what type of a board was it. Sometimes it'll be signed sometimes it won't but um i think the most infamous example for this is <laughs> because he ran a very big workshop where he ha had like 40 students working in his workshop for him and they paid him money in order to get training under him so many of his students adopted very similar styles to rembrandt um, and so actually a lot of paintings that were attributed to rembrandt were done by his students or his followers and they were not actually his. So it's kind of the opposite. Um, yeah, but I'm sure there's lots of paintings that will continue to turn up that have been done by old masters, but you know, they were not found earlier. Mm. Do you think that there's an overanalysis sometimes? Because I remember when the news of, um, I don't know if they did an x-ray on the Mona Lisa or, or what, but I remember this was like breaking, right? You know, they, they said, oh, look, there's multiple layers of the Mona Lisa. There's, you know, was it a woman at one point or, or that was a man at some time or whatever? And, you know, all these like stories came out and, you know, people started analyzing, right? Like, uh, were there different undertones of color and all of that? And they start making all these cases. Do you think like if you were to go back um, and say, you know, ask him if you could ever do such a thing like what was going on here do you think there's a chance he might say like you know i was just playing with things whereas you know yeah, fast forward to now people case. are i think people are like um <clears throat> like especially the conspiracy theory crowd mm. they i mean not to like like maybe some of the things that say are true i don't, <laughs> yeah. I don't deny that yeah but like mm. they are i'm talking about like their nature they like mm having secret knowledge that no one else has like it makes them feel special it gives them some kind of importance in life you know so mm. they try to find secret knowledge it, you know it's like the robert browning books what is it da vinci code yes yeah, dan brown maybe yeah yeah, yeah. It, it, it fills mm. their life with a bit of enchantment that they didn't have mm. before did I say Robert Browning? I think it's because I was Yeah, no, I, I, I caught, yeah. I was, okay. I was reading a poem by Robert <laughs> Browning, but I was thinking of Dan Brown. <laughs> like I said the wrong word. Yeah. That's okay. um, but yeah, I think they're trying to read too much into things. And yes, I think that's my question. I think it's a symptom of the art critic culture when in fact all art is just, is it's meant to be enjoyed. So you look at a painting like the Mona Lisa instead of thinking so much about, oh, is this secretly a man? Is this secretly, you know, is there like a Fibonacci right. sequence to uncode right. and you can open this thing and like unlock these secrets? Like there's no point in doing that. Um, mm. Yeah, I agree. I, th I think that's pointless in my opinion. Cause so... what are you gonna do with that information? Is it gonna lead to a treasure chest with money? <laughs> <laughs> right, it doesn't gain you anything at all. And you, um... You know, you hit on another point earlier that I wanted to kind of jump back on. So about art versus entertainment. I was talking to a guy, it was earlier this year, I think, and he was um, telling me that his whole life he was a militant atheist and never set foot in a church, never talked about church, never saw a church, none of these things. And he said in the 1990s, it must have been 92, 93, I think he was, he was referencing, him and a few friends went on a trip, and I believe it was to Montreal, I think he said, or maybe Quebec, but um, I want to say Montreal. And he said him and his friends were outside this beautiful basilica that was there. And, um, and he told me, he said, so my friends and I, we decided to open the door and go in. He said to this day, and this was 2022 20, now, he said to this day, um, I remember the feeling that overcame me when I opened the doors and just looked up because the beautiful art in this 
cathedral, this basilica. Um, I can feel the feeling today that I felt 30-ish years ago. And I guess my question would be, um, what kind of killed that inspiration? Why are there so why is there so much ugliness in buildings, in, in churches, in museums? Um, when you as in England, I'm sure you've seen some beautiful old, you know, century old, multiple century old, uh, millennial old buildings that just stand out, that elevate the soul. What killed it? Why are we building these? And I think there's a movement in France too. I think there's this artist in France. He's building these ugly glass like box buildings and people are impressed by this or what have you. What shifted? What changed? What brought about this ugliness that people are, are revering as something inspiring? What do you think? I think that's a very complex question. I think it's not one thing. It's lots of things converging and manifesting in this one effect. Um, you know, there is the loss of belief in um, in in something that matters beyond your own life. Um, so everyone thinks that, you know, you're just a meat computer uh, in, in this body. And once you die, that's it. Like, even if you don't believe it, that you will go on, they don't even have families that they want to leave a better world for. They don't have an, any idea of belonging in some kind of line. So they don't have any respect for their ancestors and they don't have any hope for their descendants. So they're kind of isolated um, on a metaphysical level. So they see no point in making things of lasting value. They see no point in um, anything beyond their life. So I think that's part of it. And that leads to a type of depression because then what? why does anything matter if you're gonna die in like you know a couple decades? Um, there is, I think it's also a matter of bureaucracy because architects, you know, young people who want to build things that are beautiful, who want to make uh, wonderful works of art in society, they, they just have so many barriers of bureaucracy against them because the people who are the leaders of society have put those there. And they, even the ones who are the leaders, they might have inherited them and they, they feel powerless in removing them um, because they're just so much. And I think the bureaucracy, the paperwork, the institutions that are just bloated with administration have are like primarily responsible for limiting the ability of artists to make good work because, you know, making a building does cost money. And if, you know, a company is not willing to fund somebody's ideas because it doesn't go with, you know, city guidelines or what the larger company wants them to build. Um, or what the, the, you know, the academics are saying in the papers to make, um, and they just won't fund it. So I think it's because the patrons are um, motivated by the by capitalism, rather than being motivated by higher ideals. And that's, that's another reason for it. And so I think the idea of an aristocracy is, you know, a noble class of society that has money, and wants to use and is able to use it for things that won't necessarily make a profit, but will improve the lives of their citizens, of, of the people that they live with um, immeasurably. And then also, you know, leave behind something beautiful and amazing for their descendants. Um, a great example of this is Notre Dame. So mm. the, yeah. the book about Notre Dame is actually about how it was built over the centuries by people who lived in that community. And they were, it was built by generations and generations putting in work into Notre Dame. And it was very interesting because it talked about the fact that there were some people who worked on Notre Dame who would never see it finished, like their grandchildren or great grandchildren mm. would see it wow. finished. So it was that, it's that ability to see something is mattering beyond your life, I think, metaphysically and philosophically we don't have that um and also you know the the ruling class of our society is not run by ideals they're run by uh you know what makes the quickest profit while they're in power because their power is also ephemeral so two questions do you think i, I posted a picture a while ago it was a cathedral in france um 
however, from the 1200s, maybe. Do you think the talent to make that is gone? Can people do that anymore? And my second question is, um, you know, I'm a little bit ignorant on this. I remember people saying, you know, yeah, this is beautiful, but King, maybe Louis the Ninth, whoever it might have been at the time, built this, but threw the country into debt because of it. Um, is there a lot of truth to a statement like that? And, and um, or do you think those are maybe some misconceptions or some lies being spread just to kind of, um, you know, attack these these beautiful buildings, these beautiful works of art? I think it's I think it's meant uh, to attack the work of art because if we think about you know King <clears throat> Louis who built Versailles and all of these beautiful yes. palaces, building these palaces is not what put him into debt. What put him into debt was supporting the American Revolution, supporting mm -hmm. the Americans, um, lending money all over the place to different wars. That's what put France into debt before the French Revolution, not building its palaces. And actually, its palaces and beautiful buildings uplifted the people and helped them feel that there's something worth living for that they loved that their country was a beautiful place to live and they could enjoy these public spaces i think wrath of non is a great twitter account i used to follow and mm -hmm. um, does a great job explaining how beautiful cities make the people who live in them more mentally healthy and then mm -hmm. mentally healthy people make make for better societies with less crime and more camaraderie and you know just just better society in general um and i and if you think about like you know is it worth making these useless build useless artwork and buildings and it could throw the country into debt think about how much countries today wealthy countries today do that throws pe throws them into debt that yeah. offers absolutely yeah. nothing to their people like you know helping uh refugees from like other con like countries oceans away while their own people are starving and unable to pay for right heating now. during the yeah. winter like don't, isn't that a waste or spending tons and t like millions <clears> and billions <throat> of dollars building windmills that actually don't help the environment kill birds and also worsen the environment because you know you're mining for the materials and uh funding the factories that are making them so it, it it's like there are a lot of ways that governments waste money, but I don't think the arts is one of them. And in fact, the money that you spend in arts pays back, pays you back in ways that you can never measure in material ways. So is that talent gone though, Mega? Like, do you think people can still build that? I think the, like the raw talent, <clears throat> I don't think it's gone. I think it's, like, I think it'll be difficult, though, to rebuild a society where you can collect people to build that again. But then again, we have, like, the power of technology to help us. Um, but the thing is, if, you know, if the arts are really killed, if something really kills them, you have to start again from scratch. And according to this art historian I love, Bernard Berenson, art goes through different stages of life, just like a living organism. So it goes from, like, primitive to archaic to um like to classic you know so it's it goes through these stages as it's mm. developing so you know you had in the early renaissance they didn't really understand perspective and so even though there are many beautiful paintings um you know the perspective was off or you know if you look at Botticelli's Venus and you look at it carefully and I have an article about this on my Substack, the mm -hmm tracing how art developed through the depictions of Venus over time. And in Botticelli's Venus, um, the arms and body parts are kind of lopsided in the wrong size and, and placed wrong. So if she were a real woman, she would be like really deformed. Um, but it's it was still beautiful because, you know, the spirit in the work was still there and it was masterful. Um, so I think that the in order to build up to that level of skill where we can build a Notre Dame again, it will be difficult. But I think it's hard to say that it's impossible because we have so much incredible technology today to help us. Hmm. Yeah, um, I did see I don't know if it was in Florida or somewhere down south here um, where they did build something that was very reminiscent of, you know, a, a, you know, 16th century um, building in France and machines did assist as they wouldn't have back then. But people are like, wow, so it can be done. You know, like the the, the ability is there. Um, 
but there's just maybe the desire to do it right and so just and the money right the the money and yes more than anything um just the last question though um so the classes that you teach and that you you offer to students what would you say your um your your goal is like what are you trying to teach or to leave other other people because your work is incredible it's very fascinating and i you know even looking through your instagram posts your instagram stories the way you explain and 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 even depict the works of art that you share is very um it gets a conversation going even mentally with myself i I think through it so what would you say like you're you're trying to work towards with with other people what are you trying to spread what's what's the goal of yours so i think i had this idea that the reason people don't value the arts or they they um overvalue mediocre art is that they don't know how amazing art can be so the, we, um, in the modern West, you keep seeing the same five paintings over and over again to represent classical art, which is, you know, the Van Gogh painting, the Gustav Klimt, the Kiss painting, you see a Monet painting, and that's just put on all the coasters. Oh yeah, and like, you know, Michelangelo, that's it. Mm-hmm. It's put on all the coasters, it's put on coat bags, it's put on like scarves. And that's the only thing people really know. If you ask an average person, name an artist, they'll say like Monet. Um, And that's on purpose. And it's tragic because these are like, like these are good artists, but they're by no means the best artists. And they actually represent the moment when art declined. Like their work has traces of decline in them. Like Monet's art in the beginning was amazing, but it really went like became trash near the end and people don't like to admit it because of his reputation which is really tragic because they're denying their senses what their senses tell them is the truth because they're afraid to upset the academy um so what i try to do with my art lessons is show people i don't put down artists i don't spend it hating monet um (laughs) i spend my classes just every week i i show a different artist and we just look at his his uh, collection of work. Um, we discuss each painting and what makes it interesting, a little bit of history about it, what makes it um, artistically interesting to look at, how does it tell a story? And I think when people are, people see a lot of amazing art, they are able to compare in their minds because once you've seen, for example, um, you know, Viktor Vosnetsov painting of, um, Ivan and the Grey Wolf carrying the princess through the woods, and it just—it's so wonderful to look at. Or um, once you've seen, um, you know, Vermeer's paintings, you just can't look at mediocre art again in the same way because you know there's something better out there. It's like if you've been to—if you've tasted gourmet food, if you've tasted the best chicken soup in the world from a gourmet restaurant. And you and you eat something that you bought like a ready meal from like mm. the grocery store, like you you yeah. will no longer appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, it's very true. Just totally off off subject, but my grandmother was like the best in my mind anyway, the best cook in the world, and so her food was like you know up here. Yeah, so you and had so a every- standard. I had so a standard, it's just about of course. Giving people standards again, and like right. Because this I, type of art is I not agree. taught anymore in public schools anyway, in mainstream institutions. And you're right. I think I'm like I said earlier, I'm pretty ignorant on this. Um, and there are names that I the basics, Monet, you know, you throw those names out there. But like it's like what we've lost a lot. And I think education has slipped so much where, um, you know, we don't focus on this anymore. We as a society and I don't know numbers, but we uh, the average intelligence has had to just collapse. It's had to because yeah. because you don't hear any of this discussed anymore. You know, I didn't learn it. And the reason for that, I think, is the lack of standards that is put on people. Um, people are encouraged to be accepted for who they are instead of being called to improve themselves to become the noblest version that they can be. Um, when I was in university, I used to tutor um, students to help them write essays. So I, you know, I would sit mm-hmm. with them and try to figure out how they can structure their essays so they can get a good mark. Uh, mm-hmm. And most students, mm-hmm. 
age like 20, they can't even speak in a full sentence. Yeah. In fact, most people I realized as I got older cannot speak in full sentences. When I read their Instagram captions or how they talk, how they write, they cannot explain their most basic beliefs in a logical, coherent way. When they, if they do speak in like, um, if they do speak at any length or like write, it's all copy pasted propaganda in their writing. It's so, it, it's so bizarre to consider because they're not even aware how much their thinking is being um, infiltrated by media and, prop and its propaganda. And I think when you are not a <clears throat> thinker, when you're not taught to read and write properly, your mind is more vulnerable to this infiltration because you have nothing in there to, to mm. offer any defense. Didn't you just post um, a headline of uh, an article or whatever, where, or maybe it was an Instagram caption, and the woman said that, like, in order to speak before a group of people, she needs a Xanax? Wasn't that oh, something yeah. that... Yeah, that, that was like yeah. a medical student's blog <laughs> that I reposted. And so, you know, all of these skills are lost. You know, I think... Um, they still offer public speaking in schools, they still offer art in schools, but I think the maybe just the level of interest people have as a whole general population, I, I wonder if it's dipped, you know, I, I remember um, when I was in college going to the writing lab for, you know, we would be able to go there and, and people would help, you know, with your writing and help develop your writing and, and all of that. And I remember sitting with people and again, all oh, this is this is university and looking at their work next to me, not to say I was anything special or gifted myself, but it's like, wow, this is like a first grader. I, I know kids who write better than this. And it's like, people are getting dumber as they're, they're getting older. I mean, I remember working with young kids, um, some very intelligent. I had, uh, you know, I, I'm thinking of some girls in my class some years ago now that when I taught um, who were extremely intellectual in both not just the way they wrote or did math or you know performed on tests but just the way they carried themselves and i think a lot of that is lost and um so i love what you're doing i love that you're you know trying to bring people back into this beautiful world that is art you you got me interested like i need to sign up for your class. <laughs> do i get a discount no um but no I, i'm really you're great to talk with and it was a lot of fun any closing thoughts anything you want to maybe add uh, before we wrap up today um, I would just say if you want to know about the work that I do with the art club, um, mm -hmm. my website's called classicalidealsedu.com. Perfect. Well, thank you, Mega. It was great to chat with you and um, always fun to spend time with you and learn a lot from you. So thank you for coming on today. Thanks for having me.